Academy Spark. Uh, hi, welcome to Jazz Free Academy Programming Language Course. It's called a seminar. Uh, I'm the TA, Serene Holt. And before we start, let me briefly introduce myself. Uh, I'm currently a uh, vice undergraduate host, and I'm uh, it's now my third year at Pi. Uh, last year, I joined the PLRG, the Google Professor of Freedom, and uh, my main research interest is Pi Vista of programming languages. Also, uh, last summer, I went to EPFL and contributed to uh, making Scholar Compiler. So, uh, let's begin. Uh, I want to do a quick survey. Uh, please raise your hand if you write Scala code more than 10 lines before except a uh, programming language assignment. Then, uh, have you ever experienced uh, ML or standard ML or OCaml or any other variant? Anyone? Great. Uh, or uh, is there anyone took a course uh, CS220 programming principle by Professor Han before? No one? <laughs> yeah, very good. Uh, it's a very intro introductory seminar to functional programming, so yeah, I think I'm a very good audience. Then uh, let's begin. So, what is Scala? Scala is Scala meant to scale up a language, and it is mix of object-oriented language, and also it has some functional language features. So both features uh, makes language scale. Uh, I expect that most of you already experienced some object-oriented feature using Python or Java in the introductory course for CS. But I think uh, functional programming is not so familiar to most of the students. So during the seminar, I will talk about functional programming in mainly. So, it is the survey by GitHub uh, about the number of PR for each language. So, um, the screenshot is not so loud, but, um, but here is Kala. So, it is quite not many, but actually, there is there are hundreds of languages, so maybe we can say that it's quite popular in some sense. It's about top 10 languages or top 15 languages. So, so, and this is another metric. It is survey from Tower Flow. Also, in this survey, Kala is located at the 15 or 20th rank. So, Scala is not the most popular language or very popular language because there are many other languages on the top of the chart, like JavaScript or Python, C, C++, Java, or famous languages. But uh, I'm going to show um, Scala is also has some users and has some needs for Scala. So, who uses Scala? Uh, of course, obviously. In PLRG, our group uses Scala. So, in PLRG, we made developer analyzer named Safe, and also is currently developing. So, Safe is written in Scala. Also, a uh, Scala compiler is written in Scala, and because all the Scala I think the Scala is the best language, and there is no reason not to use Scala for making Scala compiler. It's very obvious. Also, um, the Fortress language project is terminated before, but um, Professor Yu, Yu uh, was on the Fortress team, and at the time, Fortress compiler was also written in Scala. Akka is a library written in Scala. Uh, it's a concurrent programming library, and used by many companies the famous companies like Intel, or Intel, Walmart, and so on. Also, uh, Apache Spark is um, well-known framework for data programming, and 
it's mainly written in Scala, also we use other languages, and also it supports Scala API. The other famous framework within Scala is Play Framework, so it's basically web framework. And it's not very popular, but some companies are using Play Framework for some reasons, like Samsung or EA and so on. So I showed you that Scala has some users. And one of the pros of Scala is it is very good cool language for introduction to functional programming. So if you study Scala, you can easily learn other functional languages, including Ocamo, Pascal, or Arlang. So uh, functional language is not mainly used language in the industry, but obviously there are some needs for functional language for some reason. I will explain the reason in the so there's some slides. So first, account is used by Facebook to implement Infer, which is a Java and C or C++ setting analyzer. Also, Facebook make Flow, which is JavaScript by Checker, and it is written in Ocamo. And some other companies also use Ocamo. And one of the interesting companies is JavaScript. Uh, it is the financial company that it makes their every software in Ocamo. The other very famous and very clear functional language is Haskell. So Haskell is used for some very private or internal program for some famous companies. And also Erlang and Elixir are functional programming language. And they are also very good for concurrent programming. So WhatsApp or Pinterest and other companies are using these languages for data programming. So why these companies want to use functional language? So functional language and functional programming have some pros. First is very good to reason for verified programs if it is written in functional style. Also, functional programming, when you write program in functional style, then it would be very easy to parallelize. Also, uh, if you are wanting to write very simple algorithm, then functional language will not be the best choice. So C or C++ will more for for things, but when you want to build very, very complex program and very complex structure, then because functional language can make very high level abstraction for program, so functional language will be better choice. And also, you can model and create complex structure. So why functional language can do this? There are three main features of functional language. The first one is immutability, so we'll talk about immutability today mainly. Um, the other two features are high order functions and other things like and pattern matching. So we'll see these features through the seminar in this in this semester. So um, I think that you everybody learned WAE in today's yeah, lecture, right? So WA is a very small language, and it is not very similar to the other language which you used before. First, when it declared variable, so it directly declared variable apps, then we can use apps, but we cannot change the value of apps. Of course, we can define the apps again, but actually it is a different variable, and so it is uh, high given by the scope. Maybe you are more familiar with some this kind of program. You declare some variable and there are some <coughs> statement you can make some branch or superflow chain. And you can reassign new value to already defined variable. So we call 
this part as the imperfect part. Uh, I will not explain details about this part, but uh, it is mainly want to say uh, what actually the machine, the computer, have to do. So um, take variables and modify the value and jump or go back and and everything. It is very similar to what really machine is doing. So actually, in Scala, uh, we can write code in both styles. We can write code in imperative part, or we can write code in more functional ways. So in Scala, we can declare variable which is mutable or which is immutable. If we use val keyword, the al keyword, then this variable cannot be changed its value. So if we declare variable x and assign new value to it, then it will generate an error at compile time. However, if we use the bar keyword, the ar keyword, then this kind of variable can be reassigned. So this is more imperative style. We declare mutable variable and change its value over the program run, and the above it is more functional. We do not change its value, and program is not like the machine, what really machine is doing, but it is more declarative, so what is for? So we'll see what I mean in the future. So for why we, uh, what are some good things when we use immutable, immutable variable or immutable some data structure. Actually, mutable are more flexible or convenient, maybe, but oh, there are some good reasons to use immutable things. Of course, it is easier to reason about, and yeah, so uh, I will explain this thing with some example code. Of course, if we declare variable, Immutable variable app, then in this code, we can sure that x, value of x will remain 1. It never changed. So whenever x occurs in the app of the code, then we do not need to read any other section of the code because we are sure that x is 1. But if we use mutable variable, then X can be changed in anywhere, then you have to read all the code to check that X is changed or keep its value. Maybe it is not so big problem if the code is written by yourself, then because you will know all the thing of the code and where X is changed or not. But if you are working on very, very big project and working with each other, then majority of the code will not be written by you yourself, then it will be much harder to expect what that will be at this point. Also, uh, even though we use immutable variable, still we can't use double data structure. So list and list buffer, both are uh, collection in Scala standard library. And list is immutable collection. So if you declare list which contains one and two, then this list of them will always contain one and two. It is not be changed. So uh, if you pass this object to another function, then x will be the same value exactly. And after the function, x still remains in the same However, if we use list buffer, then the list buffer can be changed. So in the initially, it contains only one and two, but you can remove one or two from the, the list buffer, or you can add zero or three or anything to the list buffer. So then, in this middle of the code, the list buffer can be changed. And moreover, if you pass this instance to another function, and Inside this function, uh, it can modify the argument, which is this list buffer. So 
I'm not sure that active fields have the same value after the executing this function. Also, um, when we use global variable, then of course global variable can be immutable, but usually global some global variable is immutable and keep some data in very global immutable storage. So when you write code like this, then it means this function will not depend only on the given parameter or argument of the function. It depends on the global space. And you cannot check, and you cannot uh, expect what will be the result of this, this function by reading only this code. So if we write this code, then uh, value of the return value will be depend on only x. However, in this case, we have to check z, so where it is defined, and what is the value of z at this point, and what where w is defined, and what is the value of w at this point. So it's more hard to expect and reason about the program. Also, it is a very related problem. So if you need value of f after the after calling function f, then we need to keep the value of f when we use mutable data structure. Because inside function f, x can be modified. However, if we use mutable variable, a mutable variable, then we are sure that x will not be changed after executing the function f. So, uh, usually, when we use mutable data structure, you need, we need to make some defensive copy of the instance. Also, functional programming has its cons on parallel computing because uh, it is very safe to access concurrently on some data. If you use some global um, mutable data structure, then in one thread, it can the value of the, this buffer can be modified, and in the other thread, it will read the value of this buffer. Then, the result of the execution of the program will depend on the order of executing the statement. If this statement, which is appending three at the input buffer, if this statement is executed earlier than GX, then at this point, X will be this buffer with one, two, and three. However, if this GX function call is executed before this statement, then X will have um, this buffer with one and two. So if you want to control the behavior of program, then you will need some lock to control the order of the program. However, if you use immutable collection, then there is no way to change the value of this global data structure. So if you want to another use another data structure, then you have to make new data structure. And then, uh, even though the order change, the program behavior will be always uh, equal. The last reason is immutable object will make fake hash key. So I will show this example with some example run. Uh, so uh, at this point, you, you, yes, all of you already have the slides, and the slides are available from the website. So if you need a slide. Now, if, if Fonte is not large enough, please uh, see the slide uh, in your laptop, uh, please. Um, so in this code, uh, list is in the bubble, as you know, and the buffer is in the bubble. So a set is a set, as you know, uh, which contains a distinct element. 
and usually set is hash value of the object to check if the object is equal or not. So when you put this x in the set, then it is sure that y always contains x. However, its intuitive behavior will not be satisfied in the default case. When we use this buffer, we declare x and define set y, which includes x. And at this point, all y contains x, obviously. However, if we modify x by appending 1 to the list buffer, then the hash value of the instance will be changed. And then, if we check whether y contains x again, then at this point, it will respond false because hash value has been changed. But actually, y um, obviously contains x at this point, so we can run this code. Uh, I already write this code here, and um, by using log command, we can execute the code. So as you see, see here, uh, at port, it returns true, and then it returns false. So maybe it is not so big problem if you're using a step, but if you use a map, which is um, mapping from key to a value, then the problem will be a bigger. So the force code will work correctly. However, if you use the second code, which is which you use this whole data structure, then at this point, um, because hash value of x keeps same, so y x, which one define uh, value related to x, will return zero correctly. However, if after you add append one to this buffer x, we try the same value, but because hash t has changed, so it will raise an exception and maybe the program will be done. And we can also run this code. So I already write this code down here and running on this code. At first it returns zero correctly. However, at this point, um, no such element exception has occurred. Until now, uh, I explained what is the cost of using immutable things. Now, there are some good things when it is written in mutable things. However, there are some good things when it is better to write in immutable way. So, one of the handling some repetitive things is using loops. However, if all the things are immutable, then if uh, executing any statement cannot change anything. So if you run the loop, then nothing will be changed and loop will not end. So it will not, it, the program will not terminate. So then what do we have to do? In this case, we can use recursion. So, Recursion is very widely used in functional programming. And instead of reassigning a new value to a variable, we can call the same function again with the different argument. And then we can do some repetitive things. And if you write the correct code, then the program will be terminated. Uh, recursion is not always good because some things are more readable when you write it in imperative class, and some things are more readable when you are you write the code in recursion without loop. However, recursion has another good thing, which is it can reflect uh, the mathematical definition exactly. So we'll see this. 
so from now on, let's define method factorial. So as you know, factorial is a product one from one to n is factorial n. So let's assume that if input is market, then just return one to simplify the code. So if we use while is not large enough. So it is very imperative style because it is column. So we use while here and we have variables here. So we increase the value of i from 1 to n and we multiply i to result and we will return result at the end of the function. So it is correct code and works well. Let's check it. So it will return the correct value, as you see. So it is a very imperative style code. The other way to write the same thing is using for loop here. So actually, this call for is very and expressive feature, but uh, this code is more like target style. So in here, we define little variable level, and we will multiply from one to n to the result and return the value of the result. So also, this code works well. Because Scala is very high level language, you can <laughs> write the same code in a more simpler way and more intuitively. It is the product of the number from one to ten. So this code works well. As code. So now you can check it. Then now we'll practice. Yeah, how can write this code in recursive way? So let's write it. First, we need some base condition which will terminate this recursion. So what would be the base condition for factorial? Now one. <coughs> if n is smaller than one, we can just return one. Then now we have to write the code for inductive case. So what should we do here? Yeah, right. This is exactly the mathematical definition of factorial functions. If given value is smaller or equal to than one, then it will return one. Or if it is greater than one, then it is and multiplied by the factorial and minus one. So let's run this code. Can you make the repo like higher, making the window smaller? Because the bottom is uh -huh. not really readable. Mm -hmm. If it's difficult, yeah, yeah don't bother. Really okay. Yeah, yeah that's better. So, yeah, we can pass. This recursive version of factorial function works well. So, uh, until now, we work with very simple factorial function. But, so, functional programming is not only immutable variable, it also uses immutable collection. So, the most famous and representative immutable collection is list. So how can we define list inductively? The first, we can think list as just a finite sequence of integers. And so at this point, we will just create integer list, not any other some general list. We'll think about only an integer list. So we can think list as a finite sequence of integers. However, uh, this Definition is not so inductive and hard to return in code. So we can think about 
alternative definition. So this can be a, the empty list or a pair of an integer and another list. So for example, the empty list is obviously the empty list. And if the list contains only one, then it can be seen as a pair of one and the empty list. And if the list contains zero and one, then it can be seen as a pair of zero and list contains only one. And list contains only one is pair of one and the empty list. So we can uh, define the list in color like this. So actually you already learn how to use trade and case classes and selectors, but case objects will be new to you, so I will explain briefly so at this point. So nil is amp list and const means pair. So const one nil means pair of one and the amp list. So we can pass this definition. So first I'll explain what is case object. So we can think about in defining empty list like this, a uh, case class with empty parameter. However, actually every empty list is same. There is only one empty list. The empty list. So we do not need to make multiple instances of the empty list. So actually, case object nil means something similar to this. It is not very precise. Actually, there are more many other things, but it's a very simple, simplified version. So we can make some anonymous class or Temporally named class like dollar, dollar nil, and we make an instance of this dollar nil case class and define variable nil as this instance. And after that, we will decide not to use dollar nil class anymore. Then, this nil is the only instance of dollar nil class. So, this object keyword makes some singleton object, which means in this class there is only one instance. So in this way we can make the empty list. Now we can train list like this. Nil would be the empty list and const zero nil is a list containing only zero and so on. But actually, it is too verbose to write code always like this. So um, we will use some buffer function to define this easily. But uh, we will not talk about how this function works. It is beyond the scope of this seminar. So we will just use this function. Now we can easily define a list. As you see here, if we, we use list zero, then it will return const of zero and nil. If we call list with, without any parameter, then it will return nil the empty list. And if you call a list with one and two, then it will return const one and on to any just like that. So now we can create a list very easily. So let's play with this list. First, uh, let's write a method function, int1, uh, which takes one list and return a list whose elements are increased by one. So uh, we can write this code in 
recursive way let's do this so you already learned about simple pattern matching style as a lecture so uh, list is new or fun so you can pattern match this so then in the case of nil, what should this int1 function return? If int1 function uh, get empty list as a parameter, then because the list do not have any element, so the return list is will do not have any element, so it will be nil. Then think about the const case. So it is pair of hat and tail list. So hat is integer and tail is the list. Then what should be returned here? So it will, it will be some list. And what should be the fourth element of this list? Yeah, that's right, right? So it should be increased by one. And what should be the remaining of the list? Yeah, we can call this one uh, recursively. So we can implement in con function like this. Let's try this. We have to find some list. L is list with one, two, and three. Let me call in one case. Then the printed one is not so beautiful, but we can still read it. Uh, it is list containing two, three, and four, as we expected. Yeah, then let's generalize in one function a little bit. We can define a function in part, which takes a list and integer n and returns a list whose elements are increased by n. And this is very similar to the previous one, so we can do this. What should be here? Yeah, because it'll if we take if it takes ample list, then it will return the ample list. Then what should be here? And the fourth element will be h plus m, and the remaining should be, yeah, that's right, right. So, the fourth element will be increased by n, and the remaining parts will be constructed by the first of course. Let's try this. Call in five with L, which is list of one, two, and three. With three, then every element is increased by three, and the return to list will contain four, five, and six. Also, we can try this different argument. That's five. Then it will return the list whose elements are increased by five, so it will contain six, seven, and eight. Then uh, let's do very similar thing, one, just once more. Uh, and this time, we will define a function named pair, which takes a list and return a list whose elements are squared. And it is very similar pattern. So what should be here? Uh, it should be nil because if we just take the empty list, it will return the empty list. So what should be here? Yeah, the fourth element is h squared, which is h multiplied by h. And yeah, the remaining part will be a recursive call to p. And we can try this. Yeah. Then let me pass l list with 1, 2, and 3 to square method, then it will return a list with 1, 4, and 9, which is square of 1, 2, and 3. 
have brains. And now let's do a little bit different thing. Now I will will write a map function called odd, which takes one list and return list whose elements are in odd in the same order, but only odd elements are remaining. So every even element should be dropped after the return. So how can we write this function? What would be here? Now this list is new because there is nothing to keep if the list is empty. And what should be what should we do here? We can uh, think two different cases. The first case is when h is odd, and the other case is h when h is even. So let's check if it is odd or not. So then what should we write here? See here? Um, the return list should contain h because h is odd. Yeah, and the remaining part will be the relevance of the recursive code. Then, what if h is even? What we should write here? Because H is even, <coughs> H should be dropped from the list. So we do not need to pretend H. We just call all to keep. So let's try this definition works well or not. Maybe we better to, maybe we better to define the list than more. All function. Uh, L contains one, two, and three, and all the L contains one and three, as we desire. And L zero contains two, three, four, and five, and now all zero contains only all the elements. So all L zero is a list with three and five. Then let's do similar thing again. Now we'll write a function named positive, okay. which takes a list and return a list whose elements are positive. So uh, if an element in a given list is positive number, then it should be in the return list. And if it is negative number, then the number should be dropped in the returned list. So what should be here? So we should be here, right? And then, so what should we check here? In the previous function, odd, we check uh, h is odd or not. So here, what should we check here? Yeah, we should check h is positive or negative, um, non-positive. So we should check h is positive. So when h is positive, what should we do? Yep. The return list should keep h, and we'll do a recursive call here. <coughs> and what if h is not positive? No. h should be dropped, so I will just recursive call. Let's try this definition. Oh, actually, our this is already cons already has only positive elements, so we will define another list with some negative elements. Okay. So L one contains zero, negative one, one, two, and negative two. So little ones, positive L one should be list only containing one and two. 
and it works as we expected. So every non-positive element, zero, negative one, and negative two are dropped, and only one and two are remaining in the return list. We can generalize this positive function a little bit. We will define a function GT, which is greater than. So it will take some list and take one integer, n, and return a list whose elements are greater than n. So the elements smaller than or equal to n should be dropped, and the remaining elements should be greater than n. So similar thing. So what should be here? The list. So what should we check here? Yeah, great. And we should check whether H is greater than N or not. So in here, yeah, it should be cons of H N, the key is N, and should be passed. And if H is equal to or less than N, then here. The T L L contains one, two, and three, and we'll call this the integer two. Then among one, two, and three, three is only element greater than two, so the resulting list contains only three. If we call L with one, then since two and three is are greater than one, so the resulting list contains two and three. So it looks like GP works well also. Now uh, we'll change thing. We'll do slightly different thing. Let's define a function uh, named lang. So name tells everything here. So it takes one list and returns the length of the list. How can we, we write this function? So what is the length of the empty list? Uh, it's zero, very obviously. And then what should be the length of the cons H and P? Uh, great. It is one greater than one p. So let's have this. Error. It is um, some annoying feature of Grapple. It is not problem problem with Scala. Sometimes the old command does not work very well. Yeah. So we can try this. Because L contains 1, 2, and 3, so its length is 3. And L0 contains 2, 3, 4, and 5, so its length is 4. So function length works well. Now, last Define a function called sum, which takes a list and returns the sum of every elements in the list. It is quite similar to math function. So how can we do this? What if it's empty list? Not a little bit but we can agree that sum of the elements of empty list is zero, and what should be here? What should be the sum of the uh, elements in cons H and P? That's right. So uh, the sum will be H plus something. Try this. So, List L contains 1, 2, and 3, so the level is 6, which is 1 plus 2 plus 3. 
and because L, L0 contains 2, 3, and 4, and 5, so the result is 14, which is 2, 4, 3, so 4, 4, 5. So some function works well. Then let's define the function product, which takes a list and returns the product of every element in the list. What should be here? Maybe it's a little controversial, but mm, to work const case correctly, then the value here should be one. And here, find product should be. Return six, which is one times two times three, and product L zero returns one penny, of one penny, which is two times three times four times five. Well, do a similar thing again, but just a little, maybe a little, very little more complex than before. So, let's write a function called add back. So it takes a list and an integer and returns the same list, but the given integer is added at the back of the list. So when we want to add the integer at the front of the list, we can simply call const. However, now we want to append the integer at the back of the list. What can I do it? So for this case, it is empty list. Okay, so what should be here? So in here, you we know, can write this way or like this way, yeah, those are the same thing. And what should be here? So the given one is console H and T. So the Resulting root should take and it has h at the front and we should do recursive for here like this. So then in the fourth element is kill h, but the remaining list is the list with n appended at the back. So let's try this definition. So we call add back function with argument L and 4. So L is list with 1, 2, and 3. Now the return the list is list of 1, 2, 3, and 4. So 4 is appended at the back of the list. So I believe we can notice that uh, this list is not symmetric. So we can return the integer at the front in all one time. However, if we want to append all this at the back of the list, then we need O n time, where n is the length of the list. Then let's move on. The next thing is defining a function called append. So it takes two lists and returns the concatenated list. So if we contain, if it takes list. 0, 1, and 2, 3 as an argument, as arguments, then it will return a list with 0, 1, 2, 3. It is similar to the add back function. So we, we will take L and L1 to list as a parameter, and we will set our match on L. So what should be here? Because L is empty, the return one should be L1, and what should be here? So L is const of H and T. 
Until now, uh, we implement some functions and recursive tasks. Uh, recursion has some pros, like uh, we can do without any default fix. Also, sometimes it will reflect mathematical definition better. However, there is uh, important cons of recursion. First, it should hold function multiple times. So if we use loop, we will just go back to the previous instruction. So it's just simple go to statement. However, and so go to is must look it go to does not have some big overhead. However, method call should still stack and test parameter and return the level. So it should take some time and and do some space to go stack. Moreover, if we build stack more and more, then at some point, the stack can be overflowed. So we can check this. Um, remember the bacterial function we defined at the beginning of the seminar. If we call bacteria very big argument, then we, it, we try to compute bacterial 100,000. So at this point, the bacterial becomes overflow at some point and the exception of time. It is a big problem of recursion. However, we can optimize to avoid this thing. In Scala, if a method is head recursive, then compiler will convert it to loop automatically. So we can write a function in recursive style, however, it will have exactly the same performance with a loop. So what is tail recursion? A function is tail recursive if it ends with some value, so it returns the simple value at the end of the function, or if it do recursive code, so if it holds itself again, then we say this of tail recursion. So, however, our previous factorial function was not tail recursive, so it is not automatically optimized, and because of that, stack is overflowed. So, when we call the function, this thing happens. So, when we call factorial 4, then it should compute four times factorial of three. So new stack has been built here, and it will go to here, four times three times factorial of two, and it will call factorial again, then it will convert it to four times three times three times factorial of one, and it will be four times three times three times one, and now this method, this function call should be returned and return and return, and finally we can obtain 24. So it increases cap, so it requires space of full n. However, we can write in tail recursive style. So to convert this recursion to tail recursive style, we should pass the intermediate result of the computation. When we try to Compute factorial 4, 
then fourth, we can know that it will multiply uh, four times the previous week. So we'll pass the information that we should compute factorial of three, and already we get we have the value four. And then at this point we have intermediate level four, and we should compute factorial three. So we'll pass the information that we should compute factorial of two, and the intermediate level will be three times four, so it will be twelve. So factorial four is equal to three times that. Factorial three times four, and it will be equal to factorial two times twelve, and it will be equal to factorial one times twenty-four, and finally it will be twenty-four. So we will <coughs> write this thing as code. Now, our factorial function has an uh, intermediate parameter here, so it is the intermediate result of the computation, which is passed by argument. Then, what should we return here if n is smaller than or equal to 1? Yeah, that's right, because uh, every intermediate result are saved in inter here, and because factorial 1 is 1, so we should directly return inter. Then what should we do here? To make helpful, we should call factorial here. And what should be the argument? Yeah. Yeah, right. So here, uh, we should pass the information that we should compute factorial of n minus 1, and we already compute inter times n. So these things are computed before this factorial is called, and because of this reason, this call is the simple calling itself. So this function is a recursive function. It is n with some value or calling itself. No. We will check it is correct implementation. So if we pass four and one to as in as arguments, then it will compute factorial four times one, which is twenty-four. So it works well, but it's all verbal or not convenient because user should be should call factorial function with this intermediate level. So it's not Good, so we can slightly modify this definition. Of course, when we can remove the intermediate level here and and change this function as well as simple auxiliary function. Actually, name does not matter, but I will call this box, which means auxiliary. And simply call box here with n and 1. Then, this vector user can simply call this vector function with single argument, and we will compute vectorial of n in tail recursive way, and return the value. Let's check if this works well or not. Now it works again. With calling factorial function with argument 4, we can obtain 10. And if you want to check your implementation is really tail recursion, then you can get some support from Scala compiler. So it is not mandatory, but I can show you here. So 
we can annotate this function with tail wrap. So this modification does not change the behavior of the program at all. However, if this function is not tail recursive, then compiler will raise error at compile time. So we can check that your implementation is really tail recursion or not. So as we expect, it is really a tail recursive function, so there will not be any error. And you can check that some recursive function, which is not tail recursive one, will raise error or not. So something like this because here at pole D, which is not itself, so this method, this function is not tail recursive, so the compiler will complain that it is not tail recursive. However, in this case, it is really a tail recursive one, and there is no error. So we write the code in tail recursive class. However, uh, there is still one problem. Uh, if we call with factorial with very big arguments, something like uh, 100,000, then it will return zero because integer is actually 32 bit integer in Scala, so it is overflowed and integer becomes zero at some point and returns us zero. So we should use <coughs> big int here instead of integer. So this is a uh, one of the powerful features of Scala. The, uh, integer is primitive type and digint is not primitive type. It's supported by a library, but only changing the type and we should not, we don't need to change any other thing. So uh, we can use still multiply operator and one as digint. And because the begins is now not a 32 bit simple integer, so it will take slightly longer time, but it will produce some meaningful value. And it is still long, but however, now factorial 100,000 can be to compute. Now, unless Try other converting other functions to tail recursive form. So first, we'll try to convert in one function to a tail recursive form. So this is original implementation of in one. So if it takes one, two, and three, then it will increase one by one, so it will be two, and the recursive for here, it will increase two by one, so it will be three, and comes of this, and this, 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 so not. It will be something like this, and because here we grow tax, so if we call income function with a very long list, then tax should be awful at some point. So let's try to change this as a tail recursive function. So inc1 takes one to three. So now we will pass the information that we should compute inc1 of two and three, and we already compute q. And then we will pass, we should compute in Inc one of three, and we will pass. We already compute the two and three, and so on. However, actually, uh, this implementation is not very good because in here, two become two and three, so three is added at the back of the list, and we already know that append. Uh, or add back function requires all n time. So 
actually this tail recursive implementation of inquant requires O n stair time rather than O n, so it is bad code, but however, for practice, we will implement this. So I already my template here. So what should we return back here if it we say it's nil? Because here the nil case is at this point of the code. So it will just simply return the intermediate level. And here, we will call us with a remaining list and new intermediate level. So the remaining one is P, and what should be an intermediate one? So we should change two to two and three. So we should call add back function we defined before. And the first argument should be enter, and the next argument should be h plus one. In this way, uh, so let me see this. This inter should be list of two, and h is two, so h plus one is three, and add back inter h plus one is list of two and three. And finally, uh, at this level, we should call up function. So what should be here? So it is the intermediate result of the initial point. So it should be here. So we can check <coughs> this works well or not. So L was list of one, two, and three. So in one L works as we desire. So it will return two, three, and four. So in this way, we can change uh, add by or positive of actually they are still different, but almost same. Uh, all other functions, the tail recursive is up, but all of them will require O and square, so it is not very good conversion. However, we can change Lance function to tail recursive way while remaining time complexity of O n. So let's try this. So it is the original implementation of Lance function. Uh, Lance one two three is equal to one plus Lance two three. And it is equal to one plus one plus and three and so on. So it will call Lance function again and again and it will throw the stack. Now we can change this as a tail recursive way. So, uh, class one, two, three is equal to uh, the little task that we should compute the length of two and three, and intermediate level is one because length of one is one, and the little task we should compute length of three, and we already count two elements, and we should compute length of antilles, and we already compute length three, so the value finally returned is three. So let's implement this. What should be here for new case for out? Yeah, because it is a final stage of the recursive call, so we will just directly return the intermediate result as a final result. And what should be here? We will call box and while pass as a list. 
now we will have the main list and our first argument, and while they'll be the intermediate level, yeah, the should be increased by one. And what should be initial value of intermediate value? Yeah, it should be zero because at the initial point, there is no elemental rank counted, so it is zero. So we can check that new version of lands entail recursively works well. And so we all are almost done. We do condensely maybe. So we can do similar thing for some and product function. We can go very fast. What should be here? Yeah. To compute sum. The final Razzle should be directly passing intermediate Razzle. And what should be here? It will call out again and yeah, it will pass the remaining list and yeah, great. The new intermediate Razzle should be inter plus H. And what should be here? Now because at the initial point, intermediate Razzle should be zero. So this new version of some entire recursive way. So we convert some creative recursive version correctly. L is list of one, two, and three, and some L returns six. And then follow is almost the same. What should be here? Now we will Return into here and we'll call up here. And first argument should be key and the new intermediate level should be H times E. And the initial, initial, initial internal value should be one instead of zero. So we can check that the new version of product function in a recursive way. It's correct. It will return six for list of one, two, and three, and it will return 120 for a list of two, three, four, and five. So it is the final implementation of today. So we will make reverse function now. So some functions are easier to implement in uh, this recursive way not recursively, but some function is more e is easier to implement in a recursively. So reverse is much more much easier to implement in a recursively. So how can we compute the reverse of list one, two, and three? Then first we pass that we should compute reverse of two and three and intermediate result should be one. And then we can Pass three as the remaining list, and we can pretend to pretend two to this intermediate level to make a new intermediate level. And at this point, the remaining one should be empty list, and three will be pretended to the intermediate level. And finally, we can compute a list of three, two, and one, which is reversal one, two, and three, and it will be done in full end time because pretending is all one operation instead of all full end. So let's implement this. What should be here? Yeah, we will just directly return intermediate result. And what should be here? The first argument should be key, which is an remain list. And what should be here? So we pretend the head of the given list to the intermediate vessel to make a new intermediate vessel. So cons should be here. It will be cons of H and H. And what should be here? Yeah, 
the initial value of intermediate level should be new. Let's check this. The reversal L returns 3 to M1, so the reverse function works well. So, and I will just say briefly, so we can implement in one function in pair recursive part in OM rather than OM square if we use re reverse function. So if, when we reverse the given list at the start point and pretend it, then the final level will be the correct increase result of in one. So I don't think we just implement it because it's not so hard. So actually in need of reversing overhead, however, we can implement in one function in pair recursive style in O1 or O N. So so it's the same as before. And then of, of P and that should be here. But mm -hmm. uh, here it is different to before. So it, it is const not at back now because we will reverse the given list at the initial point. So here, that should be here. And it should be H1. Console in plus one and and when we call ops, we will start with reversal given reverse list and yes. so we can check this works well or not. What's why is it wrong? Should be here. That's so we implement in one again and it works correctly because L is list of one, two, and three, and the third one is list of two, three, and four. And we don't of all the content of this day seminar. So I'll, do, I'll summarize the seminar. So Ontolog programming is not the dominant one, but it is used actively in the industry. Also, immutability is one of the key features of ontolog programming. In ontolog programming, we use immutable variable and immutable data structure to write code. So, um, we saw some benefits from using immutable variable or collection. The, we can easily read the code and HT will be safer and we do not need to make a defensive or defensive copy and so on. So there are some benefits. However, uh, if, if we want to do some repetitive things, then because we cannot use loops, we, we should use recursion. And to optimize the recursive method, we can convert the method to a recursive way. So, this is the end of the, today's seminar, and is there any question? Great, thank you.